Today's guests, I've got Dwayne Richens and Jeremy Davis. Now, um, these guys are amazing at circle prospecting. We had a great conversation, so I asked them if they come on and share some of the things that they shared with me. So, uh, Dwayne and Jeremy, are you uh, are you guys there? Hey guys, how are you? All right, yeah. take care, guys. Yeah. I'll see you guys at the end. All right, Russ. Thanks so much, bud. All right, so uh, Dwayne and Jeremy, could you uh, just start off by just introducing yourselves and and maybe share a little bit about your first year in the business? I know you guys have been in the business for a while now, but maybe share a little bit about your first year as you do introduce yourself. So I'm Dwayne Richens. Um, I specialize in just door to door real estate. So my first year in real estate, I came in with my foot half in as I was still doing door to door alarm sales, and I made crazy money there, um, high six figures. And so I didn't know if door-to-door -door real estate would be uh, something that would be as effective. So I did it part-time. But my first month, I sold 10 homes and then um, took months. Seems two like off. it was effective, Dwayne. Seems it like you did okay. Off. It worked all right for my first month. Took month two off because I had no clue what I was doing. Months two, I sold 14 homes, took month th uh, four off. And over that first year, I sold 89 homes. So it was a great transition to get out of selling alarm systems door-to-door. -door. And it's been a huge blessing in my life, for sure. That's awesome. Jeremy, how about you? Yeah, my story is pretty similar. I've been in door-to-door -door sales for 15 years now. Um, I did alarm sales for about 10 years um, all over the nation. was a religious professor before that. Someone wanted to see if I could compete with them in door-to-door -door sales. So I did door-to-door -door sales, did really well, mainly that guy up there. <laughs> and uh did really well. Supported my family, three kids who traveled all over the country. Then we decided to plant roots, got into real estate, relocated to a brand new area. I had no database. And so I was like, well, I know how to go door to door and I know how to copy and paste. So let me try to figure that out. Um, I did 25 deals my first six months, did 75 my first year, um, just going door to door, getting the right coaches, having the right systems in place. So it's been an incredible adventure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to say something right off the bat because I, I've taught agents prospecting for, I don't know, two decades. And, uh, and there's this pervasive attitude that door-to-door uh, -door sales has, a, I don't know, a tinge to it. My experience, and I, I've been in a lot of top agent masterminds where the top agents were door-to-door -door folks. My experience is that some of the most successful agents in this industry are door to door. In fact, one of the most successful luxury agents I knew was a door to door agent. She her price point was four million, and she was knocking homes in that neighborhood. So whatever whatever mindset you have about um, door to door, suspend it for a second, and and really let's kind of dive in because what these guys are doing is amazing. So first off, I'm curious. Um, tell me about the the cadence and the schedule. What's the routine around this? And then we'll dig in on the scripting and the techniques and things like that. How often should I be going door to door as an agent and, and how big of neighborhood, how many doors am I knocking? Yeah. So door to door is a little different. You want to be in an area where people are transacting often. And so I don't want to be there in the morning because people are gone. If I call them or if I go knock their house, they're probably going to be gone, especially those townhome condo communities where you can get them to sell and then get them to buy on the other side. And so they're gonna be home four, five, six, seven in the afternoon. So our schedule that I kept that got me to produce and all the agents that are in our program is from two to nine. So we want them to be on the doors about two o'clock and go all the way until nine. There's a lot of strategy and psychology behind that. But in the morning, it's basically productive time. I want to get all my emails done, coordinate with my TC, um, do everything on social media. And then I have nothing left to but to go prospect. And so that's the, the schedule. We want people to be on the doors as long as possible. And then your neighborhood, you want about a thousand people. You want to be able to have five, six, seven, eight, nine streets where you can go up one street, come back down, go up the next street, come back down, go back to the first street. Because when you're going door to door, the greatest advantage is it's not blind. When I'm cold calling, when I'm circle prospecting, it's blind. I pick a neighborhood, I hit dial, there's no control. Door to door, I can literally look at all the houses, their home, their home, their home, their home. And it's almost like a 99% response rate where I knock on the door, I know that they're going to answer. So there's a lot of strategy, but the main benefit is I know who's home and that I can basically predict who's going to be on the other side of the door when they answer. You, you said something interesting, almost as a throwaway comment, but I think it's important. You said you're, you target areas, you'd like to target areas if you can, 
where you know there's a high likelihood that not only are they moving up, but they're moving up someplace close so you can kind of double dip that client. Is that right? Right. Okay. That's interesting. And and then when you're when you're talking about uh, a neighborhood, um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of people who aren't home and so on and so forth. And then you're you're gonna at some point hit all the the doors that you can in that neighborhood. And so what's the cycle of coming back to that same neighborhood? Hey Brian, can I interject something real quick? Um you sure. talk about you know them upgrading and moving someplace close to where you're getting two transactions. I also want you to think of how many friends they have in that neighborhood that are the same age that they connect with that then become referrals. So yeah. that, that's a huge part to this too. After two years, I was able to stop prospecting completely and sell over 25 million plus a year. And it's based off of having that same demographic of people that share your information and you usually get three or four sales out of them. So it's not just one. Not just two. You're also helping them buy the next house and sell it and buy their forever home. So, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Back to your question. Yeah, that's that's incredible. There's a lot to dig in there. But I was asking about the um, the cycle of coming back to a neighborhood. How often are you are you knocking these homes? Is it once a year? Once a you know semi annually? How do you do it? Yeah, I, I do it personally every four months. So every I'm going to back in every four months, and I don't go back with the same approach. I'm going back just to add value. Hey, there's been some real estate changes. This has gone up, but I mostly want to invite you to one of our free events. And I'd love to have you connect. And I just stay connected that way. So any questions you have about real estate, what the market's doing. And so you become a local realtor that they know and trust because you're there every four months in person. Okay. All right. So about three times a year, we're going to go do this. Um, now, before I go knock, am I doing a whole lot of groundwork? Am I, is there you know, research I need to be going and doing for that particular area? And if so, what is that? Yeah. So I basically want to know all the comps in the area, what just sold, if there's any active listings, what the average appreciation for that community is, what the price per square foot is, what they were built for, just that type of data in regards to sending mailers out and all, Door, door hangers, I don't do any of that um, because that's all right here. The value that I'm providing is up here. And so when I get to an area, the only thing that I had prepped is the night before I pick where I'm going to park my car. I pick how long I'm going to be there. And then besides that, I have like a, a knocking ritual. When I get to an area, I get out of the car immediately because the hardest door is that car door. And so I get out of the car mm -hmm. immediately. Um, I watch a motivational video by Les Brown. I've watched it for 15 years. It's like a four minute video. Um, I say my fears out loud, my affirmations out loud, I eat a piece of candy, I say a prayer, and then I go make a friend. My first goal in the first couple contacts is to make a friend, get someone to laugh, and then boom, it's game time after that. I love that. And it's so important to have those rituals. I, I was sharing, I have rituals before I come on things like this even, yeah. um, just to kind of get yourself centered and get your mind right. So that's awesome. I love that. Um, Dwayne, how about you? How, uh, are you doing a whole lot of uh, ritual work as well when you go prospect like that? I'm the same way. Jamie's pro Jeremy's probably a little bit more detailed than I am. Um, I get into the area and if it's hot, I kick the AC on, put my face right over the, the vent for like a minute and I set a timer on my phone because he's right. That first door is your car door. It is so hard to get it open. And if it's freezing cold, I mean, I'm in Utah, we would get down in the teens and we would be out knocking doors. And so I'd kick the heater on high, set my timer and, you know, know what I'm going to go do. And, and for me, it wasn't necessarily a time thing. My goal was always to have so many under contracts. And so when I first started, it was 10 under contract. My second year was 20 under contract at all times. And so it was go out and get a deal, go out and get a deal. I'm looking for under contracts. And I, I tell everybody in our programs and our coaching program on our teams, you need to be doing 250 contacts a, a week. That's the bare minimum, 50 a day, five days a week. I never worked weekends, um, Saturdays and Sundays. I was always off and with the family, but go out with a purpose to put people under contract. You are at the appointment. As soon as they open the door, you're face to face, you're there to close. So close them, get under contracts immediately. Yeah. And you said 250 to 300 folks per week, but you said contacts, not doors, right? We're talking about a lot of conversations here. Yes. Right? Okay. And uh, you may not know this off the top of your head. We didn't talk about it. Do you know, roughly speaking, how many doors you're going to knock to have those, uh, those 250 to 300 conversations? Uh, if you're doing what Jeremy said, like we can look for signs of life. You can look for doors open. You can look for lights on. You can look for you know, 
what you need to know, watch kids come home, watch people pull in the garage, close the door. So if you're looking for signs of life, you're pretty high. So you shouldn't be knocking more than 300 to get 250. Yeah, and I, I would say along those lines too is I've always described it as you start knocking with a, a tank of energy. And if you go door to door to door to door to door and no one's answering because they're home, that energy, that willpower gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then all of a sudden you're two hours in and you want to leave. So you have to protect that and you do that by spot knocking, which Dwayne talked about. Look for signs of life, make sure they're home, two cars, one car by the door, usually the decision maker parks closest to the door. If there's no cars, I'm looking for tire tracks. In the snow um, or even if it's raining or stuff, you can see when cars are pulled in and out. Yeah, so gotcha. you're, you're looking for, you know, just signs that, hey, people are home, people are not home, they've left and, and what you can do with that. And so there's the, there's the signs of life that, that people are there or not. And then there's other signs that, that you look for as well and, and give you a little clue of, of who might be there. Is that right? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So Dwayne and I are probably pretty, pretty similar here, but if I see two cars and it's like, okay, I'm going to go knock this one. I'm looking at license plates. I'm looking at bumper stickers, the type of car they have, how well they took care of their lawn. If they have any like gnomes in the yard or any decor on the door. Usually when you do it long enough, you can say, okay, Marine, nice yard, clean porch. This is probably like an analytical driver. Let me shift my pitch a little bit, knock. And so you can kind of customize that the more, more doors that you, you knock and the more people you talk to. And you can always see bikes. You can see flowered curtains, flowered couches. You right. can see inside the door when you knock. So it tells you, do we have kids? Is this a young family? Is this an older person? And you can really know who you're going to talk to before they open the door. All right. Well, so let's let's get there. So um, we did our groundwork. We, we know a little bit about the neighborhood. Um, are we do we have like flyers in our hand or is that coming later uh, through email and things like that? OK, so no flyers. So we're, we're going to knock the door and are we going to be like right up here, like ready to stick our foot in the door the minute it opens so they can't slam it? Or how are, how are we proceeding? So I, th I think the mindset honestly needs to be set first. You, you need to feel like they're stepping into your office. So have your mind ready knowing that you have information first that they need to have and that they need you because most clients need a professional real estate agent. So hopefully all you real estate agents out there are already having that mindset. But for me, I'm about eight steps back and I am cool as a cat. I am so comfortable because I've done this for so long that when they open the door, it's so easy for me just to connect with them. And no, you don't want to be right up against the door. You don't want to be broad chested to the door. You want to be at an angle so you're not, you know, intimidating to them, especially as a male. Um, I'm 6'2". So you don't want to look like, hey, I'm ready to pounce on you. You want to be back and just very, very chill and relaxed. Yeah, this is the way I was trained to is turn 45 degrees away from the door. So you're not looking like you're about to rush the door the second they open and things like that. So, so the door opens and we say what to begin the conversation. Hey, my name is Dwayne. I'm with EXP. Did your neighbors tell you I was going to stop by and see you? That's okay. the first word of my pitch. Why that? Because immediately they expect you to be selling something or wonder why you're there. And they don't want to see you. I mean, you think of all you guys that have someone knock at your door that you don't know. You're not expecting anybody. And you're like, Ugh, I'd rather be cooking, watching TV, doing anything but answering someone at my door that I don't know. So their first initial thought is, how do I get rid of this person? And so when they open the door and I ask them, did your neighbors tell you I was going to come by and see you? It's a focus redirect. It causes them to think what neighbor, why? And it goes from, I want to get you off my doorstep to no, they haven't. And their mind completely shifts. And then I ask, oh, no, no worries. Um, have you ever thought about buying, selling or investing in real estate? And that is the pitch. That is a hundred percent our pitch every time. And then you go off question-based selling from there. So there's no script after that point, but that is the initial approach. And I'm going to assume that the vast majority of time, the answer to that second question, have you ever thought about buying or selling or investing in real estate is, is no. Is that, is my assumption wrong? It is no. And I want to no. know, I do not want them to say yes. I want them to say no. Cause then I have a follow-up question that comes right after that. And it's, is this your forever home? And in the areas we're knocking, it's not. So they say no. And when they say no, guess what? They just told me they want to buy a house. So then I follow up with the next question. What's your time frame? And once they give me a time frame, it gives me something then to work off of. So they say five months, a year, two years. Why two years? What's important about the two years? 
And then I can go through and literally diagnose the whole thing and help them understand why it's better to buy or sell now than wait the two years. Okay. And, and if, if they do say two years, and I'm going to assume most people, if they do give a time frame, are going to tell you it's, it's further out. How are you following up from there? So just more questions. I mean, if you hear like my approaches, if you go to my YouTube channel, Dwayne Rich and Store to Door Realtor, you will see all I do is ask questions. I connect, ask questions, interject personality, but it's, it's just asking questions to get them to think. So what is the main reason you want to wait two years? For most people right now, the biggest objection they're getting is interest rates and the price of homes. And so I just ask them, how much do you know about the real estate market? Mm -hmm. Do you think the market's going to go up or down? Why? And it's just question after question after question. Isn't that crazy that it's doing this and that? And then another question, right? And I just walk them through a process where they tell me everything as a salesperson I would want to tell them, right? I, I want to tell them, no, you need to buy now because when rates go back down, you know, prices are going to shoot through the roof. Um, appreciation, even at an 8% interest rate, we have already seen homes still appreciating. There's tons of sellers markets across the United States, even at an 8% interest rate. They don't understand these things, but we can't just go and blast them with all the knowledge because then they think, oh, Dwayne's just there to sell me a house. He's not yeah. there for anything other than to make money. But as you ask them all these questions, their mindset changes and they start to think, oh, I never thought about that. And you're right. And yeah, I am waiting for this to crash. And it hasn't over this many years. Why would it? So it's just there's a lot of psychology behind it. Yeah. And by the way, just as an aside for everybody listening, if you've not studied the history of mortgage rates, first off, we are below historical average. We are. And also go back and look from, I think it's 1971, which is when rates went above seven. It took until 1993 for rates to go um, back down, right? That was the first time in that time period, the rates went back down. Meantime, the value of houses went from, I think it was $27,000 for the median price home to over $125,000 for the median price home. So if you're waiting for rates to come down, you are missing it, right? But people don't understand that. They think it's just going to happen tomorrow. They they turn on CNN and hear Powell's going to lower them in September. And they're they're thinking it's going to be 2.99 again. It ain't. So so making sure that we're, we're really providing that kind of historical context for folks and the, the real information can be important. All right. So you, you talked about the scripting and you're, you're asking all these questions. And I think it's funny, too, because I'm betting a lot of people think that this is a door to door that's going to lead to to later conversations. Jeremy, uh, you shared with me, I think it was your first week. How many homes did you end up going into and like doing presentations like then and there? Yeah. So my first week when I got my license, when I started going door to door, it was probably about 15 homes I got into. And I remember I called Dwayne. We weren't working together at the time. And I was like, this is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> like, how am I not going to crush it? Because in alarms, you were trying to sell three or four alarms at the higher levels per day. So you were used to like get into people's homes and do presentations. So with real estate, I would use some of the same tactics and get inside of a house, do like a, a walkthrough. And I had to learn how to do that on the spot. But it was about 15 per week that first week. And then it was about 20 a week after that. And then I had to learn how to close them, do the presentation and so forth. Yeah. So when you when you heard Dwayne earlier say you're looking to to get in and close now, he's not saying close for the appointment later on. He's saying you're you're looking to get in there. And and is that always going to be the case? No, but be prepared for that to be the case because you're going to meet people who are immediate need clients. So I want to uh, talk now about kind of some of the objections we're going to hear as we're as we're knocking doors. Um, so so let's say the conversation is progressing, but they're they're throwing out the yeah I'm I'm looking, but if we were we would use our our realtor that we used before. How are you dealing with that? I'll just give some background real quick, and then we'll have Dwayne answer it. Um, but door knocking, the objections you're going to get are the exact same that you'll get in cold calling or any other form. So there's no different, right? You have the, I have a realtor um, commissions, timing, rates, um, not interested. So they're gonna be the exact same. The difference on the doors is there's a thing called smoke screens. People have this like natural reaction just to say whatever to get you off their doorstep. <laughs> Even the ring doorbell camera right now has pre-recorded messages to kick salespeople off their doorstep. And you and I talked about this the other day, right? Yeah, I, I realized this like two weeks ago that I was looking at my ring and I was like, what is yeah. that pre-recorded? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So it's, just, it's a, a consumer natural reaction when you answer the door for them to throw whatever. So when, when you go door to door, that's called a smoke screen. So if someone says it for the first time, I don't even not acknowledge it. If you were to say that to me, I'd be like, cool. Anyways, and then I keep going in my pitch. I don't even acknowledge it. If it comes up a second time, then I'll have something like a sentence or two to give it more air. If it comes up a third time on the doors, then I'll overcome it. But that's the big difference with going door to door is you just have to kind of like let these go off, off your back because they're just trying to get you off their door. And so you just go right through it. I want six no's. I want hurdles throughout the conversation because it shows that they're interested if they keep bringing it up and it's an actual issue. But then Dwayne can walk through how to overcome it. Well, and the key factor is a lot of people don't have that agent because I'm knocking on their door is over 80% of people don't follow up with their realtors they've used in the past that don't have the number, have no clue who they are, uh, you know, how to contact them. So you're not getting a lot of those objections. But when you do, you should have a series of questions you're going to ask. And once again, it's all back to question-based selling. You're going to ask them a series of questions as you go through. And some of the questions I'm going to use, the first one I'm going to start is, well, what's the most important thing to you in the sale of your house? They're always going to come back and say money. And one thing you need to remember, everybody's watching, never ask a question you don't know how they're going to respond. Because the sure. minute you do, you're going to go, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know where to go. Uh, and it, you're, you're stumped, right? From there, they're always going to say money. Cool. Is this agent full-time or part-time? How much volume do they do? Are they someone that you could fire if they weren't doing a good job for you? And that is where you start the process down through this. How close are you to them? Now, if you can make an extra thirty dollars or $40,000 by having someone else listed, is that something you'd give away to have said family member help? You guys, I've listed homes for people where their mother was a real estate agent. Yeah. Are you comfortable sharing your financial information with said friend or family member? You know, there's, there's a lot of questions and you just go through that full step of questions and you're going to use a lot of what your client says back to formulate the next question and then just continue to walk them through the process. Uh, have you gone through a marketing plan? Have they talked to you about a marketing plan? How hard did they have to work to earn your business? Or do they just figure because, oh, that's my aunt. I don't have to do anything. And how hard will they work to maintain your business because you are a family member? Do they need to, or is this a shoe in? Oh, I've already got Aunt Sally or my nephew's deal. So I don't have to really push very hard on that one. I can go acquire more business because that one's already a shoe in. You know, so there's all these different questions you're going to ask to help them realize you've got to have someone that's hungry and that wants their business for life and their family's business for life. And that's going to push. And if I don't do my job, fire me. And I also bring that up in every one of my uh, listing agreements. If for any reason you're not satisfied with the work that I'm doing, you can cancel this agreement at any moment. How many real estate agents are saying that? Did they say that to you as well? Yeah. Again, the be benefit of door to door is as Dwayne's doing their, or as an agent's doing that, I can watch their eyes and I can watch their body language and I can see how they're responding. And I can ask a question and did that offend them? Did they get closed off? Did they fold their arms? And so you can like constantly pivot while you're with people when you're face to face. And so that adds like a whole new one skill set that you need to learn. Go buy all the books on body language and presentation. But then also it allows you to adapt quicker. When you're on the phone, you can't see that. And so you have to use more of a script. But when you're in person, you can kind of let it flow like Dwayne is talking about. Yeah, and keep in mind on this particular objection, the the stat that I hear most often is 75 to 80 percent of realtors fail out of the industry in the first two years in the business. And something like 90% in the first five years. And that's uh, the stats that float around the industry. Whether or not those are exactly accurate or not, pretty darn close. Which means chances are that person that sold them that home isn't even in the business anymore. Um, right. And so it's a simple question of when's the last time you talked with your agent about the equity you built in your home is going to kind of pop into their mind of, oh, yeah, that person doesn't communicate with me anymore. <laughs> um, all right, I, I imagine also to an, another big objection you guys get is, well, let me let me talk with my spouse or significant other. Um, yeah. So how are you dealing with that? Yeah, again, I mean, I'll always talk about like the strategy a little bit. So on this one, a lot of the times when you're door knocking, the spouse is going to be gone. That's like one of the number thing, one things that you're going to deal with. But the beauty of knocking all those hours is you can pop back by when you see both cars there. And so I can swing back by, 
I already talked to the spouse and now I can talk to the spouse and get them together. And so your evening schedule, you start stacking all these appointments for when you're going to pop back by and they're super casual. It's not like a professional. I went back to my office and prepped and came back. It's just cool. I'm going to come by, pop back by real quick and talk to both of you. That's going to happen a ton throughout your day because you're just in the area for so long. So that's actually a good thing. Um, I'm not going to push them and sell them. Like I'm not going to further the conversation or talk to them anymore. Once I know that I see the ring, I, I hear them talk about that. I kind of die out on the conversation. I'll ask them a little bit about their spouse. Like, have you guys talked about this? If you were to move, where would she want to move or he want to move? I get a little filler on the spouse and then it's a simple, cool. I'm going to pop back by. I'll put you at the end of my route. Um, just leave the porch light on or does she park on the left or right? What type of car? And then when I come back around the neighborhood, I see that they're home. I'll casually just go knock the door and, and chat with them. But it's not like an official appointment that I'm stressing about. It's just I'm casually coming back by to, to talk to them. But that's going to happen a lot. Ryan, for me, I'm going to I'm going to push as far as I can with the one layer. We call them one layers because they're <laughs> not both legs there. And uh, you, you don't want to close them or that's cause for a divorce. Who's going to buy a house without their spouse? Right. Yeah. Um, needless to say, I'm going to take whoever I'm talking to and get them to the end to where I know I'm not wasting my time going back. Then second, this is key. Do not repeat what I said to your spouse when they come home. I'm going to prep them on what to say to their spouse, because the minute they try to regurgitate that the average interest rate over the last 25 years is 8.1 percent and start giving all the statistical data and they're going to miss it and murder it. I don't want them to do that. So I just say, hey, can you repeat back a lot of the things I told you? She's like, no, not very well. Or he says, no, not very well. Great. Here's what I want you to do. Just say Dwayne came by. He had some crazy information on the market and he wants to come back by and share that with you. And I wanted him to. Can you give him five minutes? And that's all I ask. And once I get there, I'm there for an hour and close them. So that's really what you're looking for is, is just to be able to make sure, number one, that they're ready to transact. And then number two, that um, they'll prep the conversation well enough because that's the last thing spouse wants to hear when they come home from work tired. Oh, this real estate agent is going to come back by and he's going to tell you this, this, and this, and this, and this. And he goes, no, or she says, no, I'm not interested. Right. They don't tell want to them talk. in the shower. Tell them in the shower. Yeah. Yep. Well, and so what's funny. So I'm, I'm betting a lot of the agents listening to this, um, depending upon their behavioral styles and their, their uh, level of aggression and, and things of that nature, they might hear something like that and be a little, a little like, well, I don't know if I could, if I could say those things. A, yes, you can. Yes, you can. It comes with practice and it comes with technique. How you say it and, and saying it in a way that's most comfortable to you is up to you, but you can say that. But even if you don't use that script, here's the thing. What these guys are saying is you're getting face to face, you're building rapport, you're, you're letting them see you and who you are, what a professional you are, how knowledgeable you are. And you're doing something that most agents who might be circle prospecting that neighborhood never do, which is build a face to face relationship with them. Right. And, and so, Dwayne, you and I were talking and, and you want to share about um, your journey into databasing and how you got out of having to go door to door all the time for your bread and butter. Sure. So, I mean, the, here's, here's the key factor. If you knock on the right areas, you're going to get repeat and referral clients. You're getting the same objections from everybody over and over and over again. Guys, it doesn't reinvent the wheel. So once you get really good at doing this, uh, my close rate was every seven doors, I was picking up a listing at the end of my door knocking career. So when you get good at it, you bring in a lot of clients. As you bring in a lot of clients, you give them crazy good service. They start referring people. Uh, I would say events and social media was my next step. We do a ton on social media. Every time we have a success, we post it. We let people know how successful we're being. And it's always accolades back to the client. Congratulations to the Smiths on the purchase of their new home. We sold their house in four days. We sold this one for over ask price. This one took a little bit longer, but we got the deal done and got them at a great price. But it's always about our clients. And then you continue to do events where you're adding value back. Come to this movie event. Come to an Easter egg hunt, barbecue in the park, charity event, and they start inviting other people. And as you start building out that database, it's not me calling them every six weeks to say, hey, it's Dwayne again. Have you thought about selling your house yet? Um, it's adding value back to them. That's all it took. So high volume, great service, and then give back. If you do that, you're going to not have to knock doors. I haven't done it in seven years. So it's great blessings.
Yeah. And, you know, for those of you who are um, maybe your production might be off this year, maybe you're you're not on track to hit your goals for the end of the year. Listen, it's August. You got plenty of time. You heard the stats that these guys were sharing about how many deals they closed pretty quickly and how quickly you can get into relationship with these homeowners and these home buyers. So make sure that if you're thinking about doing this, you know, go check out uh, the YouTube channel. What was the YouTube channel again, Dwayne? Dwayne Ridgens, Door to Door Riller. Okay, go check out the YouTube channel. You've got great scripts there. You've got great techniques that go a little bit further than what we did in the conversation today. But this is a really good starter for you to start thinking about, uh, especially if you don't have a geographic farm, you need a geographic farm. And this is the quickest way to start dominating a geographic farm that I know of. Hey, guys, we really appreciate you coming on, sharing your hard-won wisdom with everybody. Thank you so much for that. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks a ton.